Hey everyone, I'm Katie, and I wanna thank you for joining us for another at-home experience today. Just to let you know, our preschool, children's, and student ministry content is uploaded weekly on our website at cedarpoint.church so we can continue to minister to your kids. We do have services going on inside the building now, and we'll continue with the service times of 902, 1102, and 102 throughout the month of June. We know everybody's situation is different, and we want you to do what's best for you and your family. The message notes for today's message is found on the YouVersion Bible app. Well, at this time, we are going to go into our time of worship, so join with us as we worship God. Good morning, Cedar Point family. We're so glad you joined us today. Would you stand with me and worship? For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so Coming after me. There's 
There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't sit out, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we do look to you. You are our strength. God, you help us to overcome. We're just so grateful for that. And Father, I pray for today. I ask in the name of Jesus that you would just, that each person that's watching this, that they would engage and their stories would be impacted. Lord, I thank you for the fathers and for the men that are watching. We take a moment just to honor them and to say thank you. We want to say thank you to you, Father, for being such a good father to us. And so we lift up these things. Jesus, I declare that these messages are story changing because 
that uh, you're in them. And so I thank you that you are the story changer. And we pray that, you know, the Holy Spirit would just do a work in us that, that only the Holy Spirit can do. And so, Lord, and, and that this is a growing church because people matter to you. And so I pray for everybody that's listening, everybody that's watching. I ask you in the name of Jesus that their hearts would be grabbed, that they would be arrested and attentive to what you want to do in each one of our lives. And Lord, use me. Help me to say things. Let me say things, Lord, that would speak into people's lives and they would know that you see them, that you love them, that they matter to you. And, and just let your presence be upon my word so that it will penetrate any broken places, any hardened places, any wounded places, and just heal those things. And so we thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for all that you've done for us. I pray for the leaders of our nation. I pray that you'd give them direction. I pray, Father, that uh, for people, I pray that the church would rise up, that the church would do what it's called to do, and that it would rise up and just demonstrate who you are, Lord, and just impact our culture and not be content with sitting on the sidelines, but just rising up with the call of God upon our lives. And we thank you for that. And we look to you and we lean in and we just make ourselves available in all of this. We're grateful for all that you've done for us, Jesus. And we say this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, Cedar Point family, Pastor Rick here. I am so glad to see you and uh, I want to say hi to all of you that are home. You know, it's uh, Father's Day and uh, we want to say hi to, to all the biological dads, but also to all of you men out there that I'm sure have impacted uh, other people, other people's children in some way, uh, in a positive way, and just let you know we're grateful for you. Um, I was very fortunate. I had a good dad, and I want to say hi to my Uncle Jim. I know he's probably watching this, and, and he was my dad's brother, and since my dad's passed away, he's been like a surrogate father to me, and him and his wife, Ruth, have just been a great blessing, so I want to say hi to those guys. But we are glad that you're here. Uh, you know, we have a future uh, that's ahead of us, and so we're doing some things regarding the facility, and so I want you to see this picture. And just remind you that this is what we're doing. You guys have been so great. You've given and just continue to give, and we're, it's allowed us to move forward. And uh, we're just continuing to move forward because, as I said before, no matter what's going on, no matter how much turmoil is in the nation, no matter what uh, is going on as far as pandemics go, you can't stop the church. And the church needs to realize that, that it can't be stopped because the church has a responsibility and obligation to, uh, to impact the world that we live in. Well, I really am glad that you're here. You know, um, just we got a lot of good things going on with the Food Truck Thursday coming up and just some different things. Um, it is Father's Day, and I wanted to just share a few things with you regarding Father's Day. Um, just a few quotes here. One of these is, is that fathers are to sons what blacksmiths are to swords. It is the job of the blacksmith not only to make a sword, but to also maintain its edge of sharpness. It is the job of the father to keep his son sharp and save him from the dullness of foolishness. He gives his son that sharp edge through discipline. I thought that was good. Here's another one. And this is for all of us men. And man, if this doesn't speak to us at a time like this, I don't know what does. But it says this, The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Have an opportunity to take a chance, to take a stand, don't we? And then I like this. Dad's uh, I thought this was so good for some of you maybe that grew up without the presence of a, of a dad in your life. But just remember this, be the man you wish your father was and you don't have to keep saying, but my father wasn't around. It's a great comment. I, there's one guy on YouTube that he has a page where his dad wasn't around and so he's developed something where he shares things with you that dad should teach you. And I thought, man, what a great way to kind of turn your pain into, into a positive and just you know how God uses our pain to many times to create a calling in us. Um, here's another one. I thought this was good. Dads, this is what fathering is all about. It's about mentoring and equipping your son to become a man. It's about mentoring and equipping your son to become a man who will assume the family leadership for the next generation. In other words, you're not always going to be around. That's kind of a sobering thought, isn't it? And so uh, you want to equip your kids to be the leader of the next generation and you have no higher calling in life. It's your God-given assignment. It's quite an assignment, isn't it? Um, there's an attack on masculinity in our culture. And um, Cedar Point, one of our callings is that we are called to help men to awaken and to rise up to godly masculinity. Um, we confuse a lot of times worldly toxic masculinity with godly masculinity. And so there is a difference. You know, godly masculinity, we're called to love our wives. We're called to nurture our kids and raise them up in the nurture and admiration of the Lord, and so admonition of the Lord. 
And uh, we're just that, you know, we're just called to be men of integrity, to uh, protect our communities and to be a part of that, to not abandon them, to, to be men that are committed to our church and the call that God has on us there. And obviously, first of all, to be committed to our relationship with God. C.S. Lewis said this. I thought it was good. He said, we laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and then build the geldings to, to be fruitful. So we don't want to do that. We have a culture that's trying to do that. And so, men, we encourage you, you know, be the man that God's called you to be. Um, and then also, I, I thought Jesus, he's the picture of godly masculinity. There's some things I wrote down here. Uh, when he walked this earth, first of all, listen to this. He was fearless. People threatened to kill him, and he walked right through the crowd. Now listen, he wasn't bent or swayed by public opinion. That's pretty manly, isn't it? Here's another thing about him. He was honorable. Even on the cross, he made sure his mother was cared for. That's a pretty honorable thing, isn't it? Here's another one. He was truthful. He spoke truth to the Roman authorities and to the Pharisees. He was not afraid to speak the truth, even... Even if it was in the face of power, he would do that. He was merciful. A woman caught in the act of adultery was delivered and forgiven because Jesus stood up to her accusers and forgave her and freed her to go and sin no more. You know, sometimes as men, we have to stand up for other people, don't we? We have to stand up to their accusers. We have to stand up and be that voice that's an advocate for them. And Jesus was that example for us. He was committed to the calling of the Father on his life. He said, I must do the things my Father has called me to do. We should do that. And then also he was surrendered. One of the most masculine things you can do is surrender to the plan of God and, and how we deal with him and, and how we respond to the things that God has called us to do. And that surrender also impacts the relationships that we have with how we treat our family, with the people around us. And so we're called to do that. And so I think it's appropriate and fitting that just like we have Mother's Day, we want to honor moms. I think it's appropriate that we have a day where we honor you dads, you men out there, because uh, your presence, it's, it's impactful. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. And so we're grateful for you. Well, we started a series a few weeks ago called The Comeback, just because there's so many things going on in our culture. And so, uh, you know, they're just, you know, we've never been through this before. And so, you know, we're having to make decisions. Uh, you know, our leaders in our country are having to make decisions. And, you know, sometimes we get it right and probably sometimes we don't. And, you know, and again, I want to extend grace because I don't always get it right, you know, and, and, uh, and something you know, we learn as we go. And so that's what we're doing. But I, I do believe this, that, that some of the things that we've done have had an impact on us as Christians on the body of Christ. And so we talked the first week about coming back in our relationship with God, that that, that would be restored because in so many ways, I think it's been easy to disconnect from the things that we need to do in order to have a healthy relationship with our Father. Remember that here we don't talk about religion, we talk about relationship because that's what Jesus came to give us. And so relationships need nurturing, they need investment. Last week we talked about depression and how easy it is whenever we separate ourselves and we do different things, we can get in isolation and it's easy for us to begin to embrace thoughts that the enemy has, he tries to get them to stick. And when we do, then we hang on to those things, we disconnect ourselves and we lose sight of the fact that, you know, God's still got a plan for our lives. I shared my story with you, and, and I've had several people tell me that it really spoke to them, that they'd kind of found themselves in that place. And so I hope you're in a better place this week than you were last week. I think it's a good thing. And so we're going to continue on with this, uh, with this series that we have now, and we're going to talk about, you know, coming back to the post that God has called us to, to be in that place that He's assigned for us, and every one of us, men and women, uh, you know, young and old, we have a post. We have a place that God has given us, an assignment that He's given us, and it, uh, there's certain ways we're called to impact. And so even though that this is Father's Day and I want to speak to you, man, I believe it speaks to all of us. And I hope it gets something out of it. So grab hold of your Bibles and say this with me. Say, this is my Bible. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I declare today. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll be taught the Word of God. And I'll never be the same again. Well, hey, open up your Bibles, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 22. Now, you're still learning your way around the Bible. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament. The Old Testament starts with Genesis. The Old Testament is before the birth of Jesus. Ezekiel is in the Old Testament. And so it's right before the book of Daniel. It's several books after the book of Psalms. Psalms is kind of like right in the middle of your Bible, typically, if you're not using anything digitally. But uh, it's 
uh, Ezekiel, Daniel is the way it kind of goes. So uh, you'll find it right in there. It's a long, it's a longer book, and so it should be easier to find. But Ezekiel, open up your Bibles, Ezekiel 22. And so we're going to talk about, you know, coming back to our posts. When I say posts, you know that uh, it's kind of the place that we've been assigned, the place we've been planted, the responsibility, the calling that God has given for us. And, you know, with, you know, was, uh, with everything that's been going on, as we've stepped away and as we've been put in a place that, uh, you know, sometimes sheltering at home and that type of thing, trying to do the wise thing, trying to make good decisions. But in the process, that again, I, I think that we've gotten so focused on that that we'd really disconnected from the fact that our Father still has a plan for us. Our Father, God still has, He still, His, His will still matters in what He's called us to do. And as I've shared before, uh, as we've gone through this, that, you know, personally, I, I've dealt with some discouragement, and the Lord just had to remind me that, that no matter, you know, what takes place, it doesn't change the fact that He's got an assignment for me, that He's got, he, that he's got a calling on my life. He has a calling on your life. And there's things that He wants each one of us to do. And so we're going to talk about, you know, what happens whenever our presence isn't there, and then what happens when our presence is there, and then how God wants to use us. And so in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 25, now as I read this, He's addressing the children of Israel and telling them some things that are going on in their land. And some of it, you may think, man, that sounds a little bit like what we're dealing with right now. So let's just listen and see if you make that connection. Ezekiel 22, verse 25 says this, your princes plot conspiracies just as lions stalk their prey. They devour innocent people, seizing treasures and extorting wealth. They make many widows in the land. Your priests have violated my instructions and defiled my holy things. They make no distinction between what is holy and what is not. And they do not teach my people the difference between what is ceremonially clean and unclean. They disregard my Sabbath day so that I am dishonored among them. Your leaders are like wolves who tear apart their victims. They actually destroy people's lives for money. And your prophets cover up for them by announcing false visions and making lying predictions. They say, my message is from the sovereign Lord. When the Lord hasn't spoken a single word to them, even common people oppress the poor, rob the needy, and deprive foreigners of justice. I looked for someone. Now listen to this. So he gives all of these issues. The Lord gives all these issues that are going on in their culture all the things that are happening in their culture. And again, you know, and sometimes people are like, well, you know, I wonder what God's trying to do here. And he's pointing out that these are things that the things that they're seeing are a result of decisions that people are making. And so he says, here's what his response is. He said, I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. In other words, he said, man, I was looking for somebody and he said that would rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards land. In other words, the thing that was going to keep the people safe was righteousness. And if somebody would stand up, you know, just embrace their post, embrace the calling of God upon their life, and begin to be a voice, to be a presence, to be a force, that that, that, that righteousness, that right living, that right standing, making right decisions that that would become a protection in and of itself. And, and you know, man, as I think about it, I, I, I hope it's coming through because there just there's just this awareness in me of how powerful that is, that when we as people make right decisions and do the right thing, there's a strength and a protection that comes in that. And so he said, I was looking for somebody to do that. Would somebody just show up and do that? So he said, so he said I look for someone. Everybody says someone. I look for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone. In other words, it was like God wasn't indifferent to what was taking place. Well, Pastor Rick, why didn't he just fix it? He wanted to. He wanted to fix it. He was looking for somebody to fix it. He searched for somebody that would stand up. So he said, I searched for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land. And listen what he said but I found no one. Isn't that sad, man? I mean, it just kind of grieves my heart as I read that. He, he lists all of these things that are taking place of how people are disregarding each other and people in leadership, but not just leaders. The people weren't in leadership, so they were disregarding each other. 
and being selfish in their decisions and making decisions that were oppressive and doing things to each other for their own personal gain, for their own personal feelings, just disregarding people in general and what they would do and just felt right in doing it. And so that all those things would take place and it was bringing destruction in their land. And he said, man, he said, I see it. And he said, I was looking for somebody that would build a wall of righteousness. In other words, that would just be a protection for what was going on there. I couldn't find anybody. He said, I searched for someone so destruction wouldn't come and there wasn't anybody. And I think, you know, that, that what we have to understand, number one is this, if you're taking notes, is that our absence is impactful. Our absence, you know, I want to say to you men, to your fathers out there, to you dads, that your absence is impactful. When you're not around, it's noticeable. I've said this before that, you know, that so many times the challenges that we have in our country, the challenges in the inner city and the different things like that, hardly ever can we put that on the back of women or single moms. They've not left. They've not abandoned it. That that's a testimony to men not standing at their posts. But I want to just talk to the men for me. I want to talk to the body of Christ. That whenever we withdraw from our community, whenever we withdraw from the thing that God has called us to do, it's, it's impactful. It's noticeable. You, that w- our calling is to like build a wall of righteousness, to make right decisions. You know, and, and I know that, you know, the pressure with this, I'll just tell you the pressure for me in this, is whenever I start talking about things like this, that all of a sudden in my mind, man, the enemy just kind of like, just kind of like, you know, a, a pictures, one picture after another of just failures that I've had, mistakes that I've made, you know, when I've blown it. And he's like, man, who are you to talk to people about being right and standing upright? And I think we could all have that, right? And I mean, and sometimes he uses those things to get us to withdraw. And you know why? Because he knows if we withdraw, it's impactful. And so I just have to remind myself, you know, again, that God doesn't call me because I'm good. He doesn't call you because you're good. He calls us because he's good. And even in our imperfection, he says that when we're there, endeavoring to stand up for the right thing, endeavoring to be a presence and to be His voice and bear His image in the things that we do, that it builds a wall of protection. I, I'm just telling you, I've seen that with what's gone on, that, you know, the, and in our culture anyway, there's, for the last several decades, there's kind of been this push from our culture that, you know, the church should really kind of mind its own business and sit on the side and that type of thing. And I'm just going to tell you all right now, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. I'm not moved by that. I don't take orders from culture. We take orders from Jesus and what He's called us to do. And so we're not going to step away or anything like that. We're going to operate in the love of God in everything that we do. Jesus said that that would be our logo and our icon, that people would know that we're His followers, not because we're the angriest, not because we're the loudest, but that He would know that we're His followers because of how we love people. And so we're going to do that. But to love them, you have to be there. And so the enemy has tried to shame us. He's tried, he's tried to shame me to get me to step away, you know, just in guilt or whatever. And so I'll just stand before you right now and tell you that, hey, I am imperfect. And if you're around me for just even the short amount of time that my imperfection will show up and sometimes it will be glaringly apparent to you. But in those times, I want to do my best to apologize, to repent, and not withdraw and retreat, but to stand back up and just say, this is right, this is who we're called to be. We're image bearers of the Most High God and what He's called us to do. So number one is this, is that our absence is impactful. As we've been dis- away and disconnected, you know, the issues that we're dealing with in our nation outside of the pandemic, but the other things we're dealing with, these are things that have been around for a while. And some of them are still being, uh, you know, are, are being addressed and having, we're having to deal with those things. And, and you know, it's, we're trying to walk through it. And I believe, you know, we're, that we want to, a lot of people want to do the right thing and try to, you know, just address these things. And it takes time. It takes time. And, and so we don't want to give up. But I think that part of the negative impact that even gets worse when the church is not engaged, when the church has stepped away and just kind of been hiding, just kind of letting the world go on and that type of thing, that's not who we are. That's who we're called to be. And so that uh, with everything that's gone on as, as, we've, you know, as we've kind of retreated, and again, we've tried to do the right thing, be good citizens and be wise in how we've approached things that we've disconnected. And again, I, you know, I want to say this because I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying is that 
uh, you know, they're all kind of in different places with what's going on with, uh, you know, the COVID thing and that type of thing. And you have to follow your heart and follow peace as far as where you are, where you go, how you respond to different situations. But no matter what your decision is, that with technology and the things that we have today, that you and I can still be a presence. Now, I'm not saying get on Facebook and fight with every human being. Uh, you know, I have to learn over and over again that Facebook is not the place to settle your differences. And every time that I try to, I've tried to do that, especially when it comes to politics, it's ended up uh, just, I've, I've gotten frustrated. I mean, and so I'm like, I don't know why I keep doing that. So let me just tell you, if you don't know that for sure right now, don't do that. But there's other things we can do that can impact the world that we live in, and we can reclaim the posts that God has given us, reclaim our assignment. In other words, like, Lord, what do you want me to do right now in this moment with the circumstances I'm in? He has a plan for you. Well, Pastor Rick, I can't get out. Okay, that's fine. You need to honor that. But even though you can't get out, he still has a plan for you. And your absence, your absence is impactful when you don't embrace his plan for you. So again, number one is our absence is impactful. Look at number two, if you would go with me to Matthew chapter five. Now again, there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. In the New Testament, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Guess who Matthew is written by? If you said Matthew, you're right. You're not getting anything, but you're, you're right. You won that contest. He was a Jesus follower, and he was, a, a, you know, he was an eyewitness to what took place with Jesus. So he writes this account. And so he hears Jesus as he's sharing uh, in one of his sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. And so um, th these are some things that Jesus shared. And so in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, this is Jesus talking, and he said this. He's talking to them. He said, you are the salt of the earth. Now, again, let's consider who he's talking to. He's got this small group of followers that, that were just, they were kind of this blended mixture of people that were just, you know, that nobody, they, in anybody else's eyes other than their parents, they probably weren't special, they probably weren't world changers, but Jesus saw something in them and he called them to him. And then there was this crowd of people. Now, there was this crowd of people that were living in a day where they, had, they weren't able to vote. They had no military influence, no economic power. They had no social standing or any of those things. And if he was talking to them, all of the things that typically, or many of the things that typically you and I would use to identify influence, they didn't have. And yet Jesus said this about him. He said, you're the salt of the earth. You mean without the ability to vote, without the ability, you know, to, to uh, have any political direction or power that we're still salt of the earth? Yeah, Jesus knows the power of relationships, the power of doing right, the power of people as we follow Him, as we follow Jesus and what we're called to do. He said this, he said, you're the salt of the earth. But he said, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? And so in other words, he said that salt has a distinction. Now, I will tell you this, I've shared this story with you before, but it's the best picture. I, can, it's, it's, I haven't found a better one, so you get to hear it again. That... Um, my wife, what she would do, especially in our younger years, you know, we would go to McDonald's and as we're getting ready to order, and I don't know about you, but it would always be a frustration for me. We pull in McDonald's, we had our three, you know, our, our three kids were kind of younger at the time. And, you know, McDonald's, they, they don't change, they hardly ever change their menu. And so I'd be like, hey, we're going to McDonald's, we're going to be there in five minutes. And when we get there, you need to know what you want. And so we would pull up. And lo and behold, we, you know, they'd say, hey, welcome to McDonald's, can I help you? And I'd be like, okay, what do you want? Um, and the ums would start, and man, my frustration, I'm like, hey, I'm going to order for you if you don't tell me. And she'd be like, no, no, you're not. You're going to be nice and, and that kind of stuff. And so eventually we'd get the order. And after we had the order, then she would ask him two questions. Like if she wanted coffee, she'd be like, how fresh is your coffee? And I'm like, oh, man, you're going to ask me. And I was kind of embarrassed. The girl goes, well, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's you know, it's, we got half a pot left. And she goes, well, I would like a fresh pot. And I'm like, you're asking Lady Bray to make a fresh pot. And then she would do something else. And she would say, and I want some French fries, but I don't want any salt on them. And I'm like, that's like the best part of them. How could you not want salt on your French fries? Well, there was a reason. And that is that she knew that they always salted their French fries. And she wanted fresh French fries. My wife, is a, she's a specific orderer, okay? And so, but she wanted fresh french fries and she knew that if she asked for no salt that they would have to cook a fresh batch and so if they'd been in that fry thing for you know for a long time she wasn't getting those she was getting the fresh fries and so she'd get them on there and so then when she would get them then she'd pour salt on them herself because she wanted the salt she just wanted the fresh fries 
And the reason why she made sure she put the salt on there because she knew that it did something to the flavor. And Jesus was saying that you and I are the salt of the earth. And then he said this, that, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? In other words, if salt shows up and you can't tell it's there, what good is it? That if it's, pre, you know, that if it shows up and it's just like everything else, that it's just, it just blends in with the rest of the food and there's, there's no noticing. He said, what good is it? Because he knew that our presence is supposed to make a difference. He goes on to say this. He said, can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, again, you have to understand that salt in their days was very, it was a very pricey commodity. It was one of the spices that they would use, and there were so many things they would do with it. It would flavor food. It would preserve it. Uh, it. It had some healing properties and that type of thing. So it was expensive. And so to throw it out meant that this thing that one time would be considered expensive was not worth anything at that point because whenever it showed up, that it lost the very thing that it was called there to do, and that is make a difference in its surroundings. And then he went on to say, not only are you the salt of the earth, but he said this. He said, you're the light of the world. Now let's think about this for a minute that the world is this dark place, that it's, it's just, there's no natural light in it. It's just broken. Why will people see? And Jesus said that you and I are called to be the light of the world. He said, you're the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Back in those days, sometimes they could see a city afar off. It would be a way that they would be guided as to where they were going. Because in the dark, they couldn't tell. And they're like, where are we going? They'd see this light way off in the distance. They said, we need to head that way. Well, how do you know? That's where the light is. And so you and I are called to be light that if people need to know what direction they're supposed to go in their life, that we should live our lives in such a way that we say, this is the direction we go. Men, we should live our lives in such a way that this is the direction we go. That I want to speak to all the men out there. That's who we should, that we should be salt that when we show up. We shouldn't just blend in, that we should stand out. And again, when I say that, I'm not talking about being weird or crazy or anything like that. I'm talking about standing out in how we love people. I'm talking about standing out in how we live. And even in how we repent when we blow it, that we want to stand out in that way. That's who we're called to be. And also that we're light. This dark world needs light to know where to go. And Jesus said that that would be us. And he went on to say, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. And he said, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone. Everybody say everyone. Everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. So Jesus said that you and I are light. And he said we're like a city on a hill that when people need direction that they can see us. And then also those that live around us are people that we interact with at our jobs every day, in our community every day. Then we're around them that we give light to the world that they live in so they can be aware of where the pitfalls are, of where the potholes are, and where, where the ditches that they could fall into are, that our lives should be such that we show up and the flavor that we bring causes them to thirst for that and want it. That's what salt does. And that light gives direction as to the way they're supposed to go. And that light also reveals kind of the things that they need to be aware of in their life and the things they should uh, cla you know, latch on to and the things they should let go of and the things they should avoid and the things they should pursue. That we're called to be that kind of light. And then he said along with that, that one of the things that takes place in that, that when we're shining our light, that good deeds are taking place. And that our good deeds should shine before people. That when we do good things, that it should shine. That it should be evident. I think we have to be very careful. I, I'm very opinionated. And sometimes it gets the best of me. But I think we have to be very careful and understand that our good deeds are way more powerful than our loud words. Our good deeds are more impactful than our strong opinion. That they just are. That they're just impactful in that way. And, and I'm going to tell you that as we do that, as we love people, that we live in a climate right now that you have an opportunity to love people. And it doesn't matter who you love. 
But if you love people right now that are angry or hurt or disappointed, whether you're talking about in any spectrum of any conflict that we have going on right now, that you open yourself up to criticism. And, you know, in the church, man, we like to talk about, you know, you know, the love of God and we appreciate his love for us and loving each other. But you can't be faint of hearted and love whoever's in front of you. And I've, I've been, I'm endeavoring to make a decision that whoever the Lord puts in front of me, that's who I want to love. I want to be a light by loving whoever he puts in front of me. And I know this, that sometimes when I'm loving somebody in front of me that someone else is mad at, that they may misunderstand. They may feel betrayed because I'm loving whoever's in front of me. But I can't let that cause me to pull back and not love whoever God has put in front of me to love. And so, quite honestly, if at some point you don't get criticized for who you love, you're probably not doing it right. And so we're called to be a light. And he said, as we're a light, we let our light, we let our good deeds, which is part of our light, shine before men, shine before people. And what's the result of that? He goes on to say, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So, in other words, we let these things shine, not so they'll notice us, not so that we'll get all the attention and all the recognition. We'll do it so they'll be grateful to God. So they'll know that the Father sees them. And I think, you know, we just have to remind people sometimes whenever God compels us to be good to people that, hey, you know what? I just want you to know that the Father sees you, that He's aware of who you are, that He's aware of what's going on in your life. The Father sees that. And so you and I are called to be that. And so, you know, I said in point number one, that our absence is impactful. Well, here's the second thing. Our presence is powerful. That the reason why we need to re-engage is because when we show up, our presence is powerful. You know, when there are things that take place in our community that they have potential to go in various directions, I feel compelled to be there. I feel compelled to be there. And I feel compelled to be good to whoever else is there, whether I agree with them politically or not, whether I agree with them society-wise or not, that God has called me, He's called us to love whoever's there. And that is a powerful statement. And it is a light to the world around us. And if we're doing it right, then those that are loved in some way, they see that it's the Father loving them through us. You know, we say around here that one of our things that we're called to do, you know, we're called, we're a story changing place. We want to be relentlessly good to our community. And we're here, we're not called to see through you, but we're called to see you through. And you know what, probably of all the things that we say, people say, I really like that statement. And you know, and it is kind of, it's compelling and that kind of stuff. But let me tell you something, the one that I, that I get the most criticized for is when I'm having to see somebody through, that me seeing them through, that sometimes it's a person that's hurt or wounded somebody else. And they're like, how could you be good to them? How could you, because it's who we're called to be. And so, you and I are called to get back to our post, and that means the relationships that God has put in our life, that we connect with Him, that we let Jesus just work through us, and let Him do in us whatever it is that He wants to do. To you dads out there today, to you men out there today, you know, again, we live in a culture that's tried to push you to the side, that's tried to, try to tell you that your role is not significant, but I'm just telling you right now that your absence is impactful. It's impactful when you're not there Things just don't, they're not just neutral, but they head in a wrong direction. And when you show up, your presence is powerful. And again, by not being the angriest person there or the loudest person there or even the most right person there, but it becomes powerful when you show up with the love of God and in a strong, masculine way that you love the people around you, not out of fear, not because you're afraid they'll reject you, not because you're afraid you'll be misunderstood, but you show up and love people because people matter to God. Your presence is powerful. And that's why the enemy has tried to relegate the church to the corner, to the sideline. So it's kind of like the enemy said, you guys just sit over here and we'll take care of this. Well, you know what? We've seen what happens when they take care of it. We've seen what happens when the church does that, when the church is nice. And so the church is called again to let the love of God to be this thing that's, it's just, it's, 
it's powerful. It's, uh, you know, it's strong. There's just something about it that it's, it's almost kind of has this dangerous feel to it. That that's who we're called to be. And so Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, but what good is it if, if salt is lost its flavor? If it quits having an influence, what good is it? Can, can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. When your light is shining, it cannot be hidden. No one light, one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, uh, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. We're to be image bearers. We're to be image bearers who we're called to be. And so I want to say, I want to say to the men, first of all, but to everybody, but to you men, since this is Father's Day, man, if you disconnected, if you found a seat and you're just sitting in the bleachers, you were never created to be a bench sitter. You have the call of God on your life. Your presence is needed. It's needed. Just like we read in Ezekiel that God looked for somebody that would stand up and let a wall of righteousness be built which would protect the relationships and the city and the nation that we live in so that judgment wouldn't come on it, but he couldn't find anybody. Man, I hope that's not the testimony of our time. I hope when he looks in northeastern Oklahoma that he doesn't say, there's so many things I wanted to do for them, and there's so many things that I wanted to influence and turn the tide on those things, but I couldn't find anybody. I don't want that to be us. I want to be us. Men, I don't want it to be us. I, I want to say you have a place. You have a position. And, and to reclaim your post, what God has given you. Ladies, I want to say you have a place that God has called you to do, that He's called us to do. And again, you know, it's Father's Day, so that's kind of who we're draining this to. But it applies to all of us, doesn't it? That if we've disconnected from what God has called us to do, then we have to re-engage and reconnect and be who He's called us to be. So number two is this, our presence is powerful. Let's look at number three. You're in Matthew there. Go to Matthew 28, the last chapter in the book of Matthew. Matthew 28, verse 18. Now Jesus had been crucified. He'd been raised from the dead. And He had appeared to the disciples on different occasions. But here He's giving them final instructions. And in Matthew 28, verse 18, it says, Jesus came and told His disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. In other words, because He was raised from the dead, he was given authority. So he's given authority. He said, because of that, therefore, in other words, I, they used to say, you see your Bible teacher say, whenever you see a therefore, find out what it's there for. And so he's saying, therefore, because he has this authority, that because of that, then we should go. Everybody say go. Therefore, go and make. Everybody say make. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So he's called us, he said, look, I've been given all authority, and as my follower, because I've been given all authority, I don't want you to stay and wait, I want you to go and make. So number three is this, our calling is to go and make. In other words, that we're not called again to sit on the sideline. We're not called again to hide in the stands and, and cheer from the upper section or boo or be critics you know, in the middle of the crowd, we're called to engage because our absence is impactful. It impacts our world. It impacts our community. It impacts our family. It impacts our church. It impacts the things that God has called us to do in the place that He's put us. And our presence is powerful. It's powerful when we're engaged and we show up and let Jesus lead us in how we deal with our family and let Him lead us in how we respond in our community, and let Him lead us in how we deal with other people. Not just, not just people that disagree with us, but especially people that disagree with us. Jesus covered that. He's like, anybody can love people that are good to them. Anybody can love people that think like they do. Anybody can love people that agree with them or vote with them. He said, what difference are you from just the everyday Joe? But he said, when you can love your enemies and you can love people that think differently than you, that's when you make a difference. 
And Jesus said that He's called us not to wait for people that disagree with us to come to us. Not to wait for people that don't think like us to come to us. He said, I'm calling you, I'm telling you to go. That your role, the call on your life is so important that you can't wait for it to happen. You have to go and make. You know, our calling as a church is to introduce people to a real relationship with Jesus. We want to help them connect with a small group because we believe that in relationships, real change takes place. And we want, them to, we want to help them discover what their gifts are so they can serve in a ministry team, but also serve beyond our church doors. And, and we take that very seriously. And we're doing what we can not to wait on people to show up, but, but to go and to pursue that. But yeah, that's our vision as a church as a whole. But you know what? It's really the vision that we should have as a body of Christ. And so I want to say to you men out there, to you fathers out there, to you dads, and then I want to say to everybody else that the call of God on our life is, is, is not to sit and wait, not to say, hey, y'all need to come over here, but the call of God on our life is to go. Everybody say go and make. Say make. To go and make. He said, well, go and make disciples. In other words, go and make. Go teach people how to follow Jesus. Well, how do we do it? We talked about it. With our presence being there, letting our light, our good deeds shine Shine before men. Have you ever seen something shine and reflect? That's what our good deeds do. They shine. And then when we do it right, they glorify our Father which is in heaven. I feel very passionate about this. And I know that, you know, that if you're like a Bible scholar, if you were looking for deep today, if you were looking for, I want to know what the tense is and the Greek and that type of thing, you ain't getting it here today. But what you are getting is who we're called to be as Christians and to be real transparent with you, I don't think the world cares how much of the Greek we know. I think they do care in how we treat them. That I think if you ask a dark world what it needs more, it's not a deep Bible study, it's a deep love. And to the men out there that have been convinced by culture that your role is not very important, that you're not very significant, man, I want, I want you to push that lie away from your thoughts. And I, I want you to figuratively stand and re-embrace the post that you've been assigned to, to guard, to care for, to, to stand up for, to be a wall for, that the enemy has to go through you. If he's going to do anything, he has to go through you because you're armed with the arm of God and that the love of God is just displayed and demonstrated to who, you know, the people around you because you know that your presence is powerful. And you know that your absence is impactful. And you know that God has called you not to sit and wait, but to go and make. And that's what followers of Jesus do. I hope you're stirred. Man, I hope today on Father's Day is a great day. I hope that the people around you that love you honor you and recognize, especially if you're there with them, what a gift you are. But I hope in the middle of that, that you live a life, that we live a life that's worthy of being honored. That, that we set an example that's worthy of being valued. And if we haven't, then we don't need to wallow in it or let condemnation or guilt or shame keep us down in the mire. We can receive the forgiveness of God and make a fresh start. It's been said before that you can't go back and get a brand new beginning, but you can start right now and head towards a brand new end. And so we can do that. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute. Let's just spend a moment with God. Just let Him speak to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you speak to each person that's watching this. I thank you that the Holy Spirit is just in, in each house, in each car, in each room where people are watching this. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just deal with with each of our hearts and reveal places that we've set back, places that we've abandoned our post, places that we need to get back up and move back towards and, and just let our presence be a powerful thing that's there as we go and make disciples, as we go and make a difference with what you've called us to do. And so I thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Jesus, for the call of God upon our lives, that we can be salt, 
that we can be light, that we can be who you've called us to be. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to say one other thing, man. If you're here watching this and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and you want to do that today, I'd love to pray for you. You know, being a Christian is more than just believing in God, but it's this awareness that even though God is love, He's also just. And we lose sight of that sometimes, but because He is just, He can't ignore my sin. He can't ignore our sin. And so when Jesus came to the earth and He lived this life when He was on the cross, that the Father put our sin upon Him so that it could be judged, our sin could be judged on Him because God's just. And when we become a Christian, we recognize what Jesus has done for us. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was the Father's way of saying His sacrifice is enough. That's why we have to believe that. And so we make Jesus Lord of our life and we step out from underneath judgment. And we're made sons and daughters of God and we're made right with God. And so if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life and you want to do that today, man, I want to pray for you. Second of all, if you're watching and you say, Rick, I've done that, but man, honestly, I've abandoned my post. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I'm not doing the things I'm supposed to be doing. and I've really distanced myself in my walk with God, and I want to get back to where I was, can I? Absolutely. You say, well, how do you know? Because I've abandoned my post before, too. I know what that's like. But I can tell you from experience that if you'll turn back towards Him, Ask Him to forgive you. He'll, he'll restore you. He'll restore you. You'll, he'll reconnect you with His plan and His purpose. And when this is over, you'll be back where you were. So if that's you, if you want to rededicate your life today, I want to pray for you. And then lastly, if you're watching and you say, you know, Rick, sometimes I think I'm a Christian, but other times I struggle with what if I'm not, and I wish I could just be certain, I wish I could be sure. Well, I want that for you, and I think you can. So if that's you, if you want a certainty, I want to pray for you. So for any one of those three things, whether to give your life to Jesus for the very first time or to rededicate your life to Him or just to be sure, if that's you on any one of those things, I want to pray for you. And so, so just with heads bowed and eyes closed, let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for any person that wants to give themselves to you for the very first time. I ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that they would become a new creature in Christ that they would be born again in this moment. And Father, for anyone that's rededicating their life, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would restore them in this moment, that they would be reconnected to the plan and purpose of God, free of guilt, free of shame, rededicating their life. And then Father, for any that struggle with, am I really a Christian? I pray when this moment is over that they would know their years, not because they feel like it, because some days I don't feel like it, and they would know their years not because they always act like it, because some days I don't act like it. But they would know their years because you said, whoever calls on Jesus will be saved. So on the days I don't feel like it, and even on the days I don't act like it, I know I'm yours. Because I put more confidence in your promise and what Jesus has done than I do how good I am or how good I feel. Because your promise can be trusted. And so I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Now look, I prayed for you and that's good, right? But because God wants to be your father and wants to have a relationship with you, and in relationships, both people talk. And so, you know, it would be a bad relationship if you were married to somebody and you always had me do all the talking for you. No, 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 you talk, you invest in that relationship. So I want to lead you in a prayer where you're talking to the Father yourself. And so I want you to repeat after me. Everybody uh, repeat after me. And even if you, you know, even if you're in a good place with God, it's good to reaffirm our faith. But if, if I spoke to you a minute ago and you either gave your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicated or just need that assurance, you say this out loud. Let's all say this out loud. Say, Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, be Lord of my life. I know what that means. That means I'll do what you say. To the best of my ability, and with your help, I'll follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for all my sins. And I believe with all my heart that you were raised from the dead so I could be forgiven. I call upon you now and ask you to forgive me and to live in me. 
And I thank you for forgiving me and saving me and loving me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't that awesome? Man, I'm just so excited for you. Thank you for engaging and, you know, that we have some instructions for you. We, uh, you know, that uh, we, want, we want to give you some information, some more things, and, and just stay engaged, stay connected in this. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing services on the inside, and um, uh, for the next couple of weeks, you know, we, we'll have a room for people that just want to wear masks. And then in our worship center, uh, you can or can't. It's up to you. We have, we have uh, social spacing, social distancing, uh, set up and the way we have our chair set up and that kind of thing. So we're, we're endeavoring to, to use wisdom in what we do and try to meet everybody's needs. But we're going to continue doing this also because uh, I know we're in different places and that type of thing. But regardless, I love you guys. I'm glad we do church together. I'm glad God has called us together. And I want you to know that I'm grateful to be able to be your pastor and I'm excited for what God has for you. I'll see you later. If you made a decision today to give your life to God or rededicate your life to God, we are so excited for you. And we want to hear from you. You can message us on our Facebook page or email us at info at cedarpoint.church. We will have someone reach out to you and help you with the next steps to take. Just to let you know what's going on with our other ministries at this time, Cedar Point Recovery is meeting again on Mondays at 7 p.m. The Crossing, our young adult ministry, will not have service during the months of June and July. Cedar Point students, our ministry for 6th through 12th grade, will not have service during the months of June and July, but will continue with The Tonight Show on YouTube on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and also have some summer hangouts for middle school and high school students. You can find out the information for those on their social media at Cedar Point Students. Our kids ministry, kindergarten through fifth grade, will have service during all of our Sunday service times at 902, 1102, and 102. Our preschool ministry will not have service at this time, but they are having a party on Tuesday, June 23rd at the Claremore Splash Pad at 6 p.m. This event is for our preschool families. Pizza will be provided, so please let us know if you're gonna come by emailing info at cedarpoint.church. On June 25th, we will have a Food Truck Thursday event from 6 to 9 p.m. where we host the Kid Zone on Main Street. We will need story changers to help with this event, so if you're able to help, you can sign up by emailing info at cedarpoint.church. We want to thank you again for joining us today. We hope you have a great week, and we will see you next time.